All right. Uh, so this is uh, one of our first events for the Amazon Lab, Duke's Amazon Lab, which started the semester, but it started kind of slow given the circumstances of COVID still being with us and us not knowing how to, what sorts of events we could do. Uh, but it's, I'm really happy to have this as one of the, this is the first academic talk that we're having in the lab. We've been having a film series and a reading group, and there's many, many more things coming up in the, uh, in the spring. So anybody, even people who are not at Duke who would like to be part of this and keep talking to us, let us know and we'll keep you posted. We're going to have many hybrid events in the spring, uh, including one focused on plants and another focused on questions of memory, museums and archives in the Amazon. So uh, uh, I'm excited about that and look forward to seeing you folks in those future events. And so let me introduce our, our speakers tonight. Uh, we have uh, Amanda Smith. I'm really happy to have Amanda here. Uh, I heard about her book before the book was out from a dear friend, a common friend of ours who mentioned, oh, I have this colleague who's writing a book on mapping and literature. And I was really excited about hearing about that project. Uh, I told Amanda when I first met her in the conference and the book did not disappoint me. It's a beautiful book. It's a wonderful first book. It's a really, really lovely, lovely book. Uh, that I hope you read after you hear this talk. So Amanda Smith is Assistant Professor of Latin American Literature at UC Santa Cruz, where she teaches and conducts research on 20th and 21st century Latin American literatures and cultures. Professor Smith's research explores relationships among space, ecology, decoloniality, and development in Latin American and Latinx cultures. Professor Smith's work has appeared in several journals like the Journal of Latin American Cultural Studies, Revista, Harvard Review of Latin America, A Contra Corriente, and many more. Uh, she also co-edited the provocative graphic novel, United States of Banana. Her current book project, which is working on now, studies the impact of the current climate crisis on configurations of family and kinship in 21st century Latin America and Latinx, Latinx cultures. But today she's presenting from her, her book, recently published book, Mapping the Amazon Literary Geography After the Rubber Boom, which is out with Liverpool University Press uh, in 2021. And I also invited uh, Professor Jennifer French from Williams College to be a respondent to Amanda Smith and to start our conversation with Amanda. I hope that everybody stays after the, uh, the two presentations for, for our open, open discussion. Uh, so Professor French is the Rosenberg Professor of Environmental Studies and Spanish at Williams College. She works in the areas of Latin American eco-criticism and Paraguayan literature and cultural production. She's the author of Nature, Neocolonialism, and the Spanish American Regional Writers, University Press of New England in 2005. And she's the co-editor with Gisela Jefes uh, of the Latin American Eco-Cultural Reader, which is out with Northwestern, I think, last year, 2020. A uh, really lovely book, too, but a wonderful, very useful uh, uh, anthology. Uh, with historian Thomas Wiggum, she co-edited a critical edition of what is presumed to be the first Paraguayan novel, Juan uh, Crisotomo Centurion's Viaje Nocturno del Gualberto. Um, and her current projects include an edited collection of essays titled Changes in the Landscape, Human and Nature, 19th Century Latin America, as well as a uh, edited uh, edition of essays on Jose Estacio Rivera's great novel, La Voragine, which should be coming out for that novel's hundred, uh, one century anniversary, right? In a couple of years, I believe. Uh, so thank you both for being here and I will pass the word to Amanda now. Okay, well, thank you so much, Gustavo, for that lovely introduction and also for inviting me here today. Um, I'm really touched that so many of my colleagues from the literature department at UC Santa Cruz are here. That makes me nervous, but thank you so much for coming, especially Juan, who's now going to hear this talk for the second time, uh, but it's in English this time, so... <laughs> Um, you know, I also want to say that uh, writing a book in general is a pretty lonely and anticlimactic uh, endeavor, and it has been even more so during the pandemic, so it's really special for me to be able to share this research with you all today. Um, I'm really excited that Jennifer is here to respond. Um, her work has been foundational to my own, so this is like a dream come true for me. 
And before I begin, I would just want to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you today from the unceded territory of the Awaswa speaking Yupi tribe, which is today represented by the Amamutsan tribal band, comprised of the descendants of the indigenous peoples taken to Mission Santa Cruz and Mission San Juan Bautista during Spanish colonization of California's central coast. Namamutsan today are working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices and heal from historical trauma. Okay. So I will, uh, let me project, grab my PowerPoint. Okay. Here we go. So in broad terms, Mapping the Amazon is a book about how representations of place can shape the worlds we sense and co-construct. The project began as many projects do with an observation that led to a series of questions. First, the observation. Since the end of the Amazon rubber boom in the 1920s, Amazonia has inspired a number of novels about the violence that undergirds extractive industries in the region. And those novels indict faulty maps for their role in the continuous commodification of the forest. So now the questions. Why are inadequate maps so prevalent in such literary works? Why did intellectuals turn to fiction and particularly the novel to contest the region's cartographic records? As authors highlighted the ongoing effects of other institutional representations of Amazonia, what real impacts resulted from literary geographies entering the cultural market? And while authors wielded literary discourse to call attention to the harmful emissions of other Amazonian cartographies, what might they have inadvertently missed in their novel maps? How does geographic erasure and literary mappings resemble and differ from other forms of geographic erasure? And what are the stakes of literary cartographies? So to share how I went about answering some of these questions and mapping the Amazon, I've divided this talk into three sections. After a brief introduction, part one, making space for place, outlines how Amazonian novels invoke maps and mapping. Part two, what the novel map does not see, focuses on the Brazilian author Marcio Souza's 1980 new historical novel, Maj Maria and updates some research from the book to elucidate how even the most well-meaning uh, efforts to respond critically to the capitalist charting of the river basin can contain considerable blind spots. And finally, part three, lies or lines on paper, reflects on recent indigenous efforts to counter map nearly 300 years of cartographic myopia in imagining the significance of the Amazon region. And I'm gonna talk for about 40 minutes, but I tend to go slow so that you can kind of take it in and I have lots of pictures along the way to keep your attention. Um, and I also wanna provide a content warning that I'm going to, when I speak about Maj Maria, I'm going to describe a particularly brutal scene of violence against an indigenous person standing in the way of an infrastructure project. So I'll give you a heads up about that. Okay, first the introduction. So in Amazonia, the relationship between mapping and extractivism is well documented. The first methodical scientific map of the entire course of the Amazon River is this 1745 map by the French geographer Charles-Marie de la Condamine, published alongside the narrative account of his journey from Ecuador to the Pacific Ocean via the Amazon River in 1751. On the map, alongside lines meticulously rendered with precision instruments, there appears in Neil Safier's words, quote, an unobserved lake as a placeholder for the site of El Dorado. And you can see it blown up here, just a made up lake. <laughs> so from the earliest efforts to chart the expansive and heterogeneous region laced together by the world's largest river and its tributaries, projections of mythical wealth were authorized by their intermingling with systematized geographic data. Science and fantasy have co-constructed what Maristela Spampa calls the El Doradista vision of the region as a place where the search for legendary treasures is tautologically justified by their indisputable position on the map. Europeans filled voids in their cartographic archive of the river basin with images of unclaimed riches. And today Amazonia designates a quintessential extractive zone that is, according to Macarena Gomez Barris, a biodiverse region, quote, 
uh, reduced, quote, to capitalist resource conversion, end quote, by colonial and neocolonial tools and technologies. Charlotte Rogers has traced the colonial search for fabled riches in South America's tropics to the region's present day configuration as what Jason Moore has deemed a commodity frontier. Ana Pizarro has suggested that Amazonia's quote, most salient feature is to have been constructed by thought external to it, end quote. Even the contemporary environmentalist discourse that deplores the commodification of Amazonia's biodiversity, biodiversity often remains caught in the tradition of mapping desired resources onto the forest. A recent series of New York Times editorials in response to the catastrophic Amazonian conflagrations of 2020 was headlined, the world's medicine chest, so the belonging to the rest of the world is on fire and we, people outside of Amazonia, don't even know what's inside of it yet. So from the haphazard search for gold and cinnamon during the colonial period to the systematized extraction of latex from rubber trees during the Amazon rubber boom of 1850 to 1920, and into the 20th and 21st century logging, mining, and oil industries, identifying Amazonian resources and obscuring the harmful effects of removing them has indelibly transformed the river basin. The large-scale pan-regional rubber economy first made it possible to imagine Amazonian backwaters neatly flowing into a network of global supply chains. La Condamine was the first to report the um, caucho, that was his take on caucho, uh, to Europeans in the 18th century. However, it was not until 1839 when the U.S. entrepreneur Charles Goodyear accidentally invented vulcanization, a process that made rubber more malleable and durable, that the rush for Amazonian latex began. Mass exportation commenced in 1850 and surged with the 1890 bicycle boom in the United States and then the automotive industry. Previously tranquil waterways began to carry steamboats as fluvial roadways were linked to international export routes. The sleepy jungle towns of Iquitos, Peru and Manaus, Brazil became major uh, cosmopolitan entrepôts. And to fuel the economy, rubber barons bound their workers to insurmountable debt through the practices of habilitación or enganche, that is supplying workers with tools and manufactured goods on credit and underestimating the value of their labor so that they could never repay their debts. Entire indigenous communities migrated to avoid violent correrias in which men were captured for labor and women and children for sale into prostitution and domestic servitude sometimes by other indigenous communities who chose to serve rubber barons rather than be subjected to debt peonage themselves. Indigenous knowledge was integral to identifying, extracting, and preparing latex for export, but indigenous peoples bonded to rubber production were burdened by debt, their bodies brutalized and tortured in a system resembling slavery, far beyond the view of any state. Rubber camps, in fact, became surrogate states, granting and denying passports for traversing the rubber company surveillance network. Michael Tossig famously referred to rubber production in the Colombian Putumayo as a culture of terror that produced a space of death. In the century after the rubber economy went bust, a body of Amazonian novels has grappled with the human and ecological toll of this massive structural and social reorganization caused by the demand for rubber and solidified by later industries. In 20th and early 21st century Amazonian novels, maps are ubiquitous tropes that draw attention to the role of mapping in instrumentalizing Amazonia as a stockpile of raw materials for the developed world. In such novels, mapping also becomes an aesthetic framework to contest that process. The fictional narratives chart the river basin otherwise, crafting stories of human and ecological loss to highlight the affective experience of extractivism in contrast to the material production of passive resources. Excuse me. My book explores how well-known Amazonian novels, works by Jose Eustacio Rivera, who we just mentioned in the introduction, uh, Romulo Gallegos, Mario Vargas Llosa, Cesar Calvo, and Marcio Souza engage with maps and mapping to challenge the very precepts that authorize cartographic claims to the region and its resources. These authors use fiction to narratively plot some of the fictional qualities of official nonfiction representations of Amazonia, 
namely their affirmations of forest riches and their denial that any people or plants stand in the way of acquiring them. Mapping always necessarily involves abstraction and reduction though, and their narrative maps are no exception. As they expose one omission, they produce another. On a water break for the next section. <laughs> Part one, making space for place. So though the authors of some of the most widely read Amazonian novels were often outsiders to the specific regions they wrote about, they spent time exploring those areas, often with the express aim of better understanding them. Here's a map of um, the geographic spread of where the narratives take place for each of the texts in my study. Before Jose Eustacio Rivera wrote La Voragine, he participated in a mapping commission to mark the boundary between Colombia and Venezuela in the Amazonian frontier of both countries from 1922 to 1923. Romulo Gallegos explored the southern lying region of the Venezuelan Guayana, a geographic area stretching across the Amazon and Orinoco river basins in order to write his 1935 Canaima. In 1958, 2010, who would later be 2010 Nobel laureate Mario Vargas Llosa made an impactful journey to the Pucallpa area of Peru alongside anthropologists and evangelists from the US-based Summer Institute of Linguistics. That first sojourn in the Peruvian Amazon inspired much of La Casa Verde, as well as his other Amazonian novels, Pantaleon, y Las Visitadoras, El Hablador, and El Sueño del Celta. Peruvian poet Cesar Calvo spent many childhood summers in Iquitos with his father. His widely read Las Tres Mitades de Inomojo y Otros Brujos de la Amazonía is based on shamanic experiences that the author had in the Amazonian city. The Brazilian author Marcio Souza is a Manaus native, but his novels often unfold in areas of the forest he is unfamiliar with before conducting field research. With such diverse in situ experiences, these authors bore witness as relative outsiders to the capitalist despoliation of the forest that their narratives dramatize. Maps almost always appear in the Amazonian novels that result from such experiences as tropes for the fatuous attempts to represent the dynamic fluvial geography as a stable and static storehouse of resources. In La Voragine, the lost character Clemente Silva struggles to recall a map he memorized before fleeing his rubber camp only to defeatedly realize that his, study, his studies were in vain. And I'm going to um, read the quotes in English, but project the original here. So he says, um, what a difference between a region and the map that scales it down. Who could have told him that that paper where his open hands almost didn't fit enclosed such infinite spaces? such gloomy jungles, such lethal swamps. Two characters in Mario Vargas Llosa's La Casa Verde mock the uselessness of maps for navigating the upper Amazon. Do you remember how we burned your maps? Pure trash. People who make maps don't know that the Amazon is like a horny woman. It can't sit still. Here, everything moves, the rivers, the animals, the trees. What a crazy land we've ended up in, Fushia. With misogynistic language, so rare in Mario Vargas Llosa, irony, um, the passage references the continuous transformation of a geography where entire riverbanks fall and disappear into the water during the dry season. In each of these examples, the scientific tool, the map, falls short of its intended purpose. The text suggests that the maps are always partial and impractical, and by implication, absurd as proof of claims of ownership. In narratives that characterize resource extraction as avaricious, unrestrained, and deleterious, the appearance of a map exposes and undermines the cartographic invention of Amazonian wealth that I discussed in relation to El Dorado. In Gallego Siscanaima, an Andalusian visitor to Guayana uh, insists on the authenticity of a map of buried treasure that he himself fabricated in order to obtain permission to dig around. No one is more shocked than he when his fantasies materialize. He finds gold on this made up map. Uh, so local Caudillo brothers upon hearing news of the Spaniards exploits plant the gold to fulfill the treasure seekers dreams and distract locals from political intrigue, namely the strong men's involvement in a murder. The map then not only authorizes foreign 
and because he's Andalusian, overtly colonial presence in the Venezuelan interior, but it also erodes the pursuit of justice. Gallego seems to suggest with this parodic vignette that the lust for, for uncovering imagined wealth in the forest subsoil intoxicates both locals and travelers to pernicious ends, allowing colonial subjects to draw maps that materialize their desires of possession. Thus, Gallegos alludes to the potentially real repercussions of fictional mappings, perhaps meta-discursively suggesting the power of literary works to intervene in this cartographic archive. This simultaneous acknowledgement and subversion of the dominion of Amazonian maps charts a tension between the region as it appears on maps as an abstract space produced for capitalist resource extraction and author's firsthand sense of it as a place which permeates their Amazonian fictions. Geographers have long distinguished between space, roughly the physical properties of the world and the mathematical relationships humans use to attempt to locate themselves objectively within it, and place, a subjective corporealized experience of being somewhere derived from the senses as in a sense of place. In the French Marxist philosopher Henri Lefebvre's thesis on the production of space, the spatial practices of capitalist commodification threaten to replace place, it's hard to say that, replace place with space, um, or at the very least transform its meaning so that the ideology of capitalist accumulation appears commonplace. The rubber boom first subjected the forest to such a spatial logic, subjugating people and trees in service of global supply chains, for bicycle and later car tires, shoe, set, shoe soles, hoses, waterproof boots, and rain jackets and other commodities. By drawing poignant comparisons across scenes of deforestation, contamination, and violence produced by rubber and later commodities, literary cartographies emphatically condemn this senseless loss of place. There goes my first light. It's coming. I'll be on the darkness soon. Uh, countering what David Harvey has called accumulation by dispossession and Stefano Varese accumulation by plunder in Amazonian context, Amazonian novels present alternative means of apprehending the forest. In La Voragine, Clemente Silva is nicknamed Brujulo, which is a portmanteau of Brujula, compass, and Brujo, shaman. Oi, sorry. I'm gonna, my email just came up for some reason. Okay. Uh, he navigates the forest using his senses, he listens to plants, he observes other mammals. His embodied sensory knowledge of the forest is what allows him eventually to move in and out of the jungle undetected beyond the view of rubber camp surveillance. Gallegos' Canaima and Calvo's Las Tres Mitades replaces the rigid routes of resource extraction and the linearity of progress with the plasticity of shamanic space-time as the means of exiting the implacable cycles of resource extraction. In Las Tres Mitades, uh, one of the images that symbolizes such a rearrangement are the geometric patterns of the Shipibo designs known as Kunu, which a shaman explains in the text are kind of map, quote, but maps of wooded cities carved by impossible rivers rather than avenues, labyrinths of paths rather than little disapunched streets loves and precipices and sadnesses and swamps instead of cold parks and movie theaters and boulevards. Each binary in this passage presents an uncommodified and expansive place alongside a linear and confined capitalist space. As Las Tres Mitades narrativizes the ayahuasca journey of a protagonist named after the author, Shamanic thinking and what Leslie Wiley calls ayahuasca aesthetics, or in her study, yaje aesthetics, promise to stop the vicious cycle. Likewise, Marcio Souza replaces the linear prog progress promised by the railroad with grotesque scenes of wasteful despoliation and violence presented as inevitable in the bullheaded attempt to build export infrastructure through a tropical forest. Though Souza does not propose an alternative way of inhabiting the forest as other authors do, the mangled men and vegetation that populate the novel Maj Maria serve as the lurid si signals to redirect the course of Amazonian history. Whether painfully or hopefully, 
These alternative cartographic approaches aesthetically reinscribe place over commodity space. Okay, part two, what the novel map does not see. This is an image of the construction of the Madeira Mamore Railroad, uh, which was supposed to create straight lines through the jungle, and it is failing in this particular picture, as you will see more in the novel that I'm going to discuss. Uh, the novels that are concerned with um, how maps misrepresent Amazonia become alternative narrative representations of space themselves. Like scientific maps, literary maps situate people, characters, readers, literary critics in space and mediate their sense of place, making value judgments in order to do so, foregrounding certain features while backgrounding or omitting others. Robert Talley, one of the foremost theorists of literary cartography, has discussed the potential of literary geographies to affect readers' sense of place. Quote, the representation, the literary representation, actually fictionalizes the source from which it emanates, end quote. In other words, whether readers know Amazonia firsthand or not, images from these stories may mediate their understanding of the place, even potentially overriding sensory input should they find themselves traveling through what Edward Soja calls real and imagined places. When I'm teaching, I often ask my students if they ever went to a place that they knew already from reading or from movies. And almost everyone can think of an example about how you were actually disappointed by the place because it didn't live up to your literary expectations. So there are differences obviously between a literary cartography and a paper map. Uh, one of the most obvious ones being the form that each takes. One is narrative, the other is geometric. Um, but the more, the more interesting distinction between the two is their function. Scientific maps exploit cartographic illusion, the semblance of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two-dimensional symbols and the land. Um, in order to both facilitate navigation and concretize claims of ownership. Literary maps, on the other hand, can draw attention to the subjective processes of geographic representation that scientific maps attempt to hide. Even when literary cartographies approach geographic mimesis, their uncommon characters, often outlandish stories and overtly literary aesthetics constantly remind readers that they are traversing lands of fiction. Therefore, they can draw attention to their own abstracting gestures and by extension to those of other more illusory maps. In this way, they function as critical cartographic projects, albeit imperfect ones. Authors busy contesting the speciousness of official plans to reconfigure Amazonia for a variety of extractive purposes inadvertently and perhaps necessarily obscure other realities. Maji Maria provides an example of how a pointed critique of spatial production in Amazonia can nonetheless efface pathways out of neocolonial exploitation that the author does not see. Marcio Souza has dedicated a prolific writing career to Amazonian topics to protest the region's marginalization from Brazilian culture and politics. As he explains, any reference to Amazonian, Amazonia and Brazilian history is, quote, written in lowercase. Many of Souza's novels, like Maggi Maria, are new historical novels, a genre that utilizes satire, parody, and metafiction to undermine the integrity of historiography. Maggi Maria recounts the construction of the Madeira Mamore Railroad during the third and final phase of the project in the year 1911. Devised to connect Bolivian rubber to an Atlantic export route, the task involved laying 366 kilometers of rail through a thickly forested swamp at the border of Bolivia and Brazil in the present day state of Rondonia. The Devil's Railroad, as it was known, cost the lives of at least 6,000 workers, and that's definitely an underestimate. Um, and it also inspired the unofficial slogan, each tie a human life. This is from Ripley's, believe it or not. Those lives were lost in vain. By the time the railroad was finally inaugurated in 1912, 40 years after the initial construction began, East Asian rubber plantations were flourishing with stolen Amazonian seeds. Amazonia would no longer be the preferred source for rubber. Furthermore, three years later, the opening of the Panama Canal would offer a more viable Atlantic export route for Bolivian goods via a rail link with Chile. So Sosa takes up this completely obsolete 
behemoth of Amazonian modernization as one of many foolhardy endeavors to materialize cartographic plans for the region. Souza returns to this monumental failure during Brazil's uh, period of military dictatorships, 1964 to 1985, because for Souza, the scale and foolishness of the Madeira Mamore resonated with another major infrastructural project underway at the time, the construction of the Trans-Amazonian Highway, BR-230. As Souza explains, quote, I wanted a response to the dictatorship's megalomaniacal plans, end quote. The planned 5,200 kilometer road through Brazil's northern Amazonian regions would integrate the area into Brazil's highway network and connect to roads in Colombia, Peru, and Ecuador. Construction caused the displacement of thousands of people and satellite images attest to the deforestation the road has caused. What is more, the highway, much of it unpaved, is nearly impassable in the rainy season. In light of these projects to control and order the Brazilian frontiers, Maju Maria elaborates, according to Thomas Beebe, quote, a model for Brazilian spaces that escapes national territorial control, end quote. In other words, Souza maps the fiction of the infrastructural control over the Brazilian frontier and presages the ruinous future of the highway through its corollary in Madeira Mamore. If the Madeira Mamore and the Trans-Amazonian Highway attempted to map the Brazilian Amazon as a distant but connected site of raw materials for export, Souza's documentary intention, as Pedro Maligo has referred to it, is to dramatize the unpublicized local costs of doing so. Where roads and railways show neat lines moving forward, Maja Maria zooms in to convey the shocking violence proceduralized as part of a project seemingly leading nowhere. In a particularly dramatic scene, a fight between quar quarreling workers culminates with a machete decapitation and then gunfire to control the riotous onlookers. A Karipuna man displaced by the rail project and forced to thieve for his livelihood, loses his hands to another punishing machete. Workers in malarial agony are gagged and tied up in their hammocks so as not to attempt the construction, to interrupt the construction schedule. Bodies lay rotting in the mud at the base of the rail work, undone by tropical weather. The modernization project thus metaphorically dismembers Brazil's body politic in what Robert D'Antonio describes as a voyage to absurdity. Worse still, the engine on the rails never manages to advance in the whole novel. And the novel itself is an invitation to witness the vicious circularity of mapping the forest linearly. As Souza explains in the prologue, uh, quote, capitalism isn't shamed of repeating itself. Uh, this is one of my favorite snippets from a book of all time. O capitalismo não tem vergonha de se repetir. That's very good. One of the most jarring symbols of the devastation wrought by building straight paths to Amazonian resources is the Caripuna man named Joe Caripuna, butchered to protect the progress of the rail. To make his point, Souza uses heavy-handed symbolism to craft a narrative that qualifies as the kind of damage-centered indigenous depiction that Eve Tuck warns against. And this is the scene that I warned you about earlier. So Joe Capiruna, whose initials are JC, he has an unwilling sacrifice to the civilization promised by the Madeira Mamore. It, this scene is brutally conveyed by an ap amputation of his hands against a rail tie crucifix. In the scene, it is the civilized ones who punish JC, and the word civilized is repeated over and over again to satirize the economic modernization that sees Christ-like indigenous bodies in the path of progress as disposable. The indigenous man's ritual slaughter initiates him into capitalistic exploitation. As he convalesces under the care of the railroad doctor, he learns to play piano with his toes. His first public performance before a delegation of Brazilian diplomats visiting the construction site is packaged as evidence of the positive impact of the Madeira Mamore on indigenous peoples. Souza's insistence on capitalism's shameless repetition means that even Caripuna's amputated body will continuously be repurposed for profit. 
Eventually, he finds his way to New York City as an attraction at P.T. Barnum's Circus, and his body is exploited, is exploited offstage as well. He dies of syphilis. Martin Cooper describes the narrative arc as, quote, a darkly pessimistic and humorless view of society's descent into barbarity, end quote. And it is a vision that offers no possible exit from the cycles of neocolonial exploitation. The novel's insistence on excoriating the rail as a symbol of capitalist enterprise in Amazonia paints a hyperbolically grim picture of the future of productive Amazonian landscapes. At the time the novel was published, the acai berry had not yet become the massively popular fashion food that it is today across the globe. But an acai palm makes an appearance in Maji Maria as a harbinger of another disastrous commodity cycle to come. In one scene, two characters visit the site of the earlier 19th century phase of construction, and there they find an engine abandoned and overgrown with vegetation. As they approach, a man walks away securing his pants, and the two visitors comment on the locomotives repurposing as a latrine, describing the town of Santo Antonio as, quote, the only city along the Madeira with a public bathroom imported from the United States, end quote. Out of this engine, an acai tree reaches for the sun. The resilient plant growing on the land fertilized by the waste, the literal waste of extractivism, seems to foreshadow a dismal future for this now heavily exported superfood. But acai has largely been an Amazonian success story. Recently touted as a model for other future sustainable bio industries, acai cultivation has meaningfully connected Amazonian farmers with global markets, with minimal local impact at the sites of cultivation and harvest. So Maji Maria is not a story about sustainable agriculture. It's not about labor collectives, but rather it's an indictment of the neo-colonial destruction of the Brazilian Amazon as a metaphor for state-sponsored neo-extractivism. As such, it presents a needed focus on capitalism's waste and the violence its railway, railway plans produce. But Souza's depiction of an utter lack of indigenous agency in the face of encroaching steel lines is a common trope in Amazonian novels, especially the ones in my study. Other authors also exaggerate the helplessness of indigenous peoples from across Amazonia as ineffectual subalterns and capable of escaping cycles of abuse. Their alternative novel maps thus communicate two unfortunate but perhaps true messages. One, that extractivism wreaks havoc on Amazonia, and two, that novel maps might expose that devastation, but not do much to stop it. Okay, final section, part three, lines on paper, countermapping Amazonia. Okay, despite the counter discursive uh, impulses to dismantle the cartographic hold on Amazonia in the novels I study, these works of literature are not exactly counter maps. In the field of human geography, counter mapping has become a strategy to systematically document vital relationships to land in danger of dispossession in a language that states and corporations can easily understand. Communities throughout the world, especially those of indigenous and Afro descendant peoples, often in collaboration with activists and anthropologists, use the tools of cartographic science to, in the words of Nancy Peluso, quote, greatly increase the power of people living in a mapped area to control representations of themselves and their claims to natural resources, end quote. So authors like Rivera, Gallegos, Vargas Llosa, Calvo, and Souza certainly seem interested in decrying the role that maps have played in distressing and damaging the Amazon biome, their novel maps are not works of Amazonian self-representation. Instead, they seem to repeat one of the gestures that they most criticize, determining once again from a position of cultural exteriority, the Amazonian features most in need of archiving in the minds of readers around the world. In The Falling Sky, Yanomami shaman Davi Kopenawa calls outsiders' determination of the forest value lies. And he relates those lies to the lines that outsiders draw onto the region. In other words, he underscores the relationship between mapping and ecological destruction, 
and the lies of white people, which is how he calls them in the book. And he indirectly signals the need for new lines drawn by forest defenders themselves. So I'm gonna highlight just two of many, many projects that are currently underway. One of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of 2020 and a recipient of the 2020 Goldman Environmental Prize, the Waduani activist Nemonte Nenkimo has located one of the motivations for her forest defense work in the cartographic voids of official maps. Underscoring the urgent need for indigenous maps of Amazonia, she has explained, quote, every time I go to a school, I only see empty maps of Ecuador with no animals, birds, or plants, end quote. In 2019, mapping became an integral component of a successful Wadawani lawsuit against the Ecuadorian government for illegally authorizing use of ancestral Wadawani lands in Pastaza in eastern Ecuador for oil exploration without the consent of the Wadawani people. In response to the convenient corporate emptying of the forest for resource mapping, the Wadawani developed maps of their own rooted in the mental archive of, geogra uh, the mental archive of geographic knowledge held by elders, complemented with formal surveying and situated in place by geographic information systems technology. Where oil companies drew straight lines around geometrically determined oil blocks, the Wadawani maps highlight the locations of land and river animals, areas where medicinal plants grow, burial sites and places of historical significance, and the dynamism of areas regularly and generationally traversed by individuals and communities. To boldly visualize what the oil companies did not see, the final Wadawani maps were superimposed onto the vacant oil blocks of oil exploration. So you can see these red lines are the, the oil maps, which normally don't have the Wadawani maps underneath them. They're just empty plots of land. And then they've, they've superimposed them here. These maps render concrete the effects of oil drilling on all of these significant places. As the Wadawani lawyer explained, quote, the maps were fundamental in helping the court to understand the Wadawani's notion of land, a living territory, the space in which they develop as Wadawani beings and which they depend on to give them life and subsistence. And the maps also helped the court realize that the imagined lines are generated by the state when it creates petrol and other resource blocks are just that, imaginary and have no reality for the indigenous communities." End quote. Thus, the indigenous counter maps reconfigure blank squares of land as consequential omissions, and mapping becomes a vital practice for repurposing a colonial tool, mapping, to defend and recover colonized and neocolonially appropriated lands. Almir Nariyamoga Surui, leader of the Paita Surui people of the Teja Indigenous Sechiji Setembru, an area the size of New York City and the Brazilian state of Hondonia has similarly confronted the absence of his people's heritage on the map. In words echoing Nemonte's impressions of Ecuadorian school maps, Surui relates his first experience using Google Earth at the Google headquarters in 2007. He says, I spun the world map and zoomed straight to our territory, but instead of finding our villages, I found a green oasis marked uninhabited region. Our region was roughly the shape of a trapezoid in the middle of a yellow and gray sea representing deforested land and farms. You can see the trapezoid here in red. I immediately thought that Google Earth could be a tremendous tool to help us monitor the forest. They had nevertheless omitted one essential thing, our very existence. Surui, who has resourcefully implemented a 50 year plan to reforest Surui land, manage it and generate income from doing so, did not stop at his disappointment. He appealed to Google to correct the error and the resulting partnership has produced a multimedia map of the Terra Indigena Seche de Setembro, which employed methods similar to those used by Nenquimo's people. Um, like the Wadawani map, the, this is a, one of the, there's many images of the Google map that I'll show, but this is one. Like the Wadawani map, the Paiter Surui map visualizes the forest present as part of its multi-generational past, the audiovisual presentation of Surui history and cosmology animates a region full of life. Oral tradition appears on the map alongside flora and fauna and Surui relationships to the land. Additionally, the partnership with Google raises awareness of Almir Surui's plan to capitalize on sustainable production, ecotourism, 
and carbon credit sales to save the forest. It also provided Surui youth with training in digital technologies, which they now use to further document forest knowledge and monitor illegal activities within the reserve. These new initiatives to shape Amazonia's future by intervening in its cartographic representation attest to the continued importance of mapping as a framework for understanding the region and taking action within it. They also, however, exemplify the challenges of defending and reclaiming territories with maps, especially in the context of tech giants like Google monopolizing the global archive of geographic data. The Wadawani maps were upheld in court against the claims of multinational corporations, but only after the damage had begun. Furthermore, looking at Google Maps today, neither the Wadawani nor the Sudawi map readily appear. So if you search Google Earth for Wadawani, it takes you to San Francisco um, and to this NGO, Amazon Frontlines. This is what happens if you search the Pastaza region of Ecuador. There's no indication of Wadawani territory here either. And although uh, the Surui have partnered with Google, if you search Google Earth for Terra Indigena Sechiji Setembro, you don't see the map that I just showed you. You can clearly see where the territory is because it's forested and surrounded by deforested land, but um, it doesn't readily come up. You have to actually search Google for Baita Surui Google Earth to find the multimedia map called the true people of the Amazon and its audiovisual platform. These somewhat hidden geographies brought into view only in instances of dire urgency offer a promising area of research for those who, like the authors that I've discussed today, are committed to reestablishing the terms of the legend used to interpret the meaning of Amazonia. If cartography is a kind of narrative and narrative is a form of cartography, indigenous maps of Amazonia fall within the purview of scholars of Latin American literature and cultural studies, and their stories promise meaningful pathways out of the long legacy of imagining Amazonia solely for its use value elsewhere. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, great talk. We'll uh, pass the word to our respondent, respondent Jennifer French. Hi, everybody. I'm delighted to be here tonight with everyone. Uh, I love Amanda's book, uh, and I'm a huge fan, and I'm really delighted to be able to talk about its important contributions. Uh, as Gustavo mentioned, I am um, situated in the field of Latin American eco-criticism, and that's how I am approaching this book. Um, so mapping the Amazon enters the field at a moment when Latin American eco-criticism is wrestling with its relationship to Native American knowledge. To be clear, eco-criticism is a burgeoning field and there is a considerable amount of solidarity among practitioners, absolutely. But there is nevertheless an observable distinction, even a divide between scholars who identify the non-dualistic, non-anthropocentric ontologies of some Native American peoples, particularly those described by anthropologists Marisol de la Cadena and Eduardo Viveros de Castro as the region's principal contribution to the enormous cultural shift that the crisis of climate change requires. And on the other hand, the uh, scholars who actively opt for other non-indigenous modes of non-idealist thought, but be it Marxism, Deleuze, the new materialisms, or something else. There are a number of any number of reasons why a scholar might make that choice, of course, but one of them, and in my opinion, um, a particularly compelling one, is because of concerns about cultural appropriation and the potential oversimplification of a body of cultural knowledge that non-Indigenous literary critics, in contrast to anthropologists, are not generally trained to deal with. Among non-Indigenous eco-critics, in other words, there's a non-negligible risk of essentializing and romanticizing Indigenous thought and falling back into a kind of neo-indigenismo the post-colonial theory taught us to avoid. Mapping the Amazon navigates this complexity extremely well with rigor and coherence and with evident respect for the coherence of the thought systems with which it enters into dialogue. 
Amanda Smith insists on situating all of the novels she studies in the aftermath of the rubber boom, the entire corpus, not just the ones that center rubber thematically, like La Voragine and La Casa Verde. This is necessary, as she explains, because, and I quote, the rubber industry instigated the first far-reaching structural reorganization of the entire river basin for the purposes of systematically locating, removing, and exporting raw materials, end quote. As a structuring device, the decision to frame the project in terms of the rubber boom and its impact, as opposed to 20th and 21st century Amazonian literature, for example, makes clear how much is at stake in writing about the region, even in the case of a novel as seemingly innocuous as Cesar Calvo's Tres Mitades de Inomosho. The rubber boom as historical marker enables Amanda Smith to build a theoretical framework that effectively integrates the economic phenomenon of extractivism with a, with a rigorous anthropological accounting of the cultural systems it has impacted over many decades and an implicit appreciation of the knowledge systems developed by indigenous Amazonian peoples, as well as their ongoing political and cultural agency in the present. Mapping the Amazon shows a way out of the impasse I described a moment ago, but it also sets a very high standard for literary critics who venture into this territory. Another point that bears making is that mapping the Amazon is thoughtful, hardworking, and measured in its claims. It occurred to me as I reread the book over the last few days that each of its central concepts is actually a pairing of a key term and its opposite mapping and countermapping on the one hand, literature as a critique of extractivism or certain literary texts as a critique of extractivism and literary extractivism on the other. Each of the five chapters plots a novel on a grid using coordinates established by these two axes. To get there, and this is part of what I have in mind when I say that the book is hardworking, all five chapters proceed in a similar way reading the novels as palimpsests, or more precisely, as narratives in dialogue with more interlocutors than the authors could coherently account for themselves. Amanda Smith, who does this accounting, describes this practice as, quote, encouraging readers to move slowly and carefully through texts to uncover traces of the origins of source material, follow their trail, identify, and historicize them, end quote. This methodology may feel familiar to literary critics whose practice routinely involves recreating the historical, economic, and or ecological context of a text. The crucial innovation here and the audacity of the project, in a sense, the necessary audacity, is that she does this work across epistemological and ontological divides in a context marked by massive historical trauma and ongoing colonial violence, including ecocide. The conclusion um, supplements, it goes a step farther uh, than what I have described by supplementing the canonical literary text with indigenous audiovisual cultural production. Um, the texts that are audiovisual rather than literary in their form. Most literary critics still don't do this kind of work all too often allowing the imaginary or constructed borders of the discipline from preventing them. And so the literary text and the literary critic all too often has the last word. The ending of Amanda's book, Mapping the Amazon, is powerful because it steps away from literature confidently and with purpose. And I think this is really a perfect example of humanistic scholarship that is moving beyond critique, working in a mode that is in a more affirmative modality to amplify voices that are traditionally not heard in our disciplines in the academy. So I have a couple of questions uh, for Amanda to open up the, the discussion. And I guess I'll, I'll read them both, Amanda, and let you offer a response if, if you like. Um, and then allow other, uh, uh, you know, uh, make time for other questions from, from the floor. Uh, so the first uh, concepts, of course, as we know, concepts do work, they're intended to do work. And so I'm wondering what kind of work do you want the concept of literary extractivism to do? And my other question, 
Uh, you have been instrumental in acquiring funding to support the digitization of the archives in the Amazonian city of Iquitos, Peru. And I wonder if you could talk about that project, what it entails and how it relates to mapping the Amazon. As you say in your book, the power of literary cartography to mediate spatial experience has the effect of making the representation more real than the physical place. And the archive is a collection of potentially ephemeral traces of historical witness, seems all the more fragile in comparison with canonical literature. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. That was an incredibly generous uh, review of my book. That was very lovely to hear. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I can do these questions. Um, the second one's a little easier to answer, but I'll start with the first. Um, in some ways, literary extractivism is a term that points to something that has a long history in Latin American literature. Uh, you know, Latin American literary studies having been conceived of as um, a cultural production of the lettered city in which uh, primarily white um, affluent men for the most part were writing about their countries, their respective countries. And we get these concepts of transcultural, transcultural, transculturation and literary heterogeneity, um, which sort of speak to the fact that we have subjects writing about and representing other subjects, maybe without knowing them or knowing them superficially and having that be normalized as part of the literary canon. Um, and so I think when I looked at the way that was happening in the novels that I studied um, alongside extractivism, the concept just clicked for me that this is essentially another form of cultural extractivism, um, taking from other cultures uh, the pieces that are convenient for you as a, as a writer, as a person in a position of power to profit from them as a book that's sold on the cultural market. Um, without consulting with the people who are being represented. Um, and I think I, what I hope, I, I, I hope that the term will be used um, to call attention once again to how this is happening and what the similarities are to forms of extractivism that are also um, epistemicides, right? In addition, in addition to being ecocides, uh, as these cultures are taken and sold on the, on the cultural market um, they're also being destroyed, just as happens with uh, economic extractivism. Uh, so that's one thing that I really wanted the, the concept to call attention to. And yeah, as I mentioned, it, it is kind of a redeployment of an, an idea that's ongoing in, in Latin American literary studies. Um, as for the second question, yeah, so um, the Biblioteca Masonica in Iquitos is an archive that I consulted for this project. Um, when I first went there, I think in 2011, um, Julio Ramirez, the, the librarian, kind of took me in the back and he was like, I, I got to show you something. And he just showed me all of these um, books that had been eaten by rats, um, that were molding, um, just the dire state of the archive. And I think this is kind of an example of um, when you go to an archive, you, you sometimes you don't know what you're going to find. Um, and you don't know where it will lead you on your professional path. And I, when he showed me this, I thought like, this is awful, but I don't know what I can do about this. Um, and I had been back to the archive a couple of times after that and had just kept that relationship up. And um, a colleague here at UC Santa Cruz who left to go to UCLA to work for this modern endangered archive program um, that's out of UCLA, um, she contacted me before she left. She's like, I got this new job. It's so cool. I'm going to be helping people uh, digitize endangered archives. And um, you should apply. Do you have any archives in mind? And I said, oh, my God, yes, I, I know the archive <laughs> that needs help. Um, and actually, it's a really long story. Um, I, I, the, it's a public archive managed by the diocese in Iquitos. And so um, the bishop was actually not supportive of the project when I first tried to undertake it. Um, for whatever reason, I could I even I was in Peru. I told he didn't know. I think he distrusted me because he didn't know me. But I was in Peru, and I said I, I can I can meet you, and um, he just wasn't interested. And it was really sad for the the people who work for the archive actually, um, and and the main priest in the diocese had always been in support of a digitization project. So um, unfortunately, that O Bishop died a few years later, and when he died. Um, we had actually submitted part of the application and had to withdraw it because we didn't have support from the church. 
Um, and the, the librarian, con Julio, contacted me again, and he was like, Amanda, the bishop died. Can we still do this project? So we reapplied and got it. Um, how it relates to mapping the Amazon, I mean, in, in some ways it does and doesn't. Um, in some ways it relates in the simple way that I'm actually, it's like a true thrill to be able to have the privilege to give back to an archive that gave to my project. I think thinking of literary extractivism or academic extractivism, you know, so often we go and we take from these archives and we don't keep um, relationships with them. Um, and that's not a criticism, it's by nature of the profession and, and the time that we all have. Um, so in, in that sense, it's a true thrill. All of the money for this grant has to stay in Iquitos. I, I can't even use it for my flights. So that's a really um, important part of this grant. And um, the grant has 300, or the archive has 300 maps that have never been made available to the public. They're very hard, um, they're, they're in very poor condition. And so digitizing these maps, which are some of them from the time of the rubber boom, some of them from a little bit before, is gonna be amazing for understanding the cartographic history of the region, um, for understanding in more depth how the rubber boom actually shaped the geography. Um, and another thing that's really amazing is there are, I think, I forget the number right offhand, there's thousands of photographs um, that we don't know the who took them and in most cases, um, most of which are of indigenous people in the area. Um, and the, the communities that those people belong to have never seen those images before. Um, and so we're now going to be able to make them available digitally for anyone to access and see for the first time. So yeah, I guess I'm a little hesitant to, to relate it any more than that to mapping the Amazon because I don't know exactly what we'll find in the archive. And I, I also want to stay open to that. No, it, it's, it's fantastic. And, that, and that's a great explanation. Thank you. It's, it's just incredibly important work, Amanda. Thanks. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really excited. We'll see. I'm supposed to go down in March to get this going. So great. Um, there's somebody in the chat. Oh, somebody has to leave. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Um, John? Go ahead, John French. Uh, John, go ahead if you want to jump in and ask a question. Oh, I'm sorry. I was muted, of course. I haven't learned after two years. What can you say? Um, no, I wanted to say that as a as an historian who's not a literary critic, I wanted to ask you to position yourself in relationship to a book that I have taught more than once, which is Candace Slater's Entangled Edens, because she also, you know, it does it does super interesting things. But I'm also interested to find out that in her other book on the Amazon, where how you position yourself in relationship to it, since she is a major literary critic working on the Amazon and representations of the Amazon. Yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, Candace Slater's work is also really important to mine. Um, what I think her books do, I mean, it's funny, everything that Jennifer said about my book, uh, Candace was doing a couple decades ago. Um, she is really good at, um, you know, Ana Pizarro comes along and says that uh, the Amazon can be defined as a place that has had images projected onto it. And I think what Candace does so well in the Dance of the Dolphin book and in Entangled Edens is show how um, images have also been created from within. You know, she's really interested in following uh, folk culture and popular stories um, that are told within the Amazon region. And she did so much important field work um, to gather information for that from both of those books. Um, yeah, so I think that's what her work does. Uh, you know, mine, mine is looking at people from the outside who kind of gathered that information and wrote novels. And I think what Candace does really well is, is show how um, either there's a whole other imaginary about the Amazon that um, is, is always in construction. There's another map that I didn't show you all that is a Kukama Kuka Media map. Um, that takes some of those stories, some of those very stories that um, Candace talks about in Entangled Edens, Edens and literally puts them on the map which I think is so cool. Um, the Bufeo, the um, ghost ships, um, the Kukama Kuka Media people in Nauta and Peru have taken all of those stories and actually situated them along the rivers. And it's, it's a really cool project that I think is very much in dialogue with her work. Thank you for the question. Uh, great talk, great response. Uh, thank you both. I'll ask a question too. Um, 
thinking about your book, uh, which does this wonderful analysis of these novels and the literary literary works and the way the maps play into them, but also the way in which you end with indigenous counter mappings, right? So there's a, an interesting arc here, but I think there, uh, it makes me think of uh, the question of media in this arc, right? Because I mean, in a sense, you have to to think of the map, how novel, you do that in the book, like novels are also part of a map of production and consumption of forms of circulation. They exist in a, in a, in a, in a, in a sort of cultural map, right? That is very distinct in that, in the, in, well, not so much for the novels from the 80s, but like the novels, the earlier novels in the book, the place of the novel and of the writer is very different than the place of the novels and writers say today, right? So it seems to me interesting uh, to extrapolate from your project. And maybe you, I'm not sure if you have been thinking about this, but like uh, what, it, what it would be like to write literary works that are attempting counter mappings now when the writer is no longer a, a, a figure that, that yields the authority uh, that, it, that they used to in another moment, but also what other kinds of, of media productions uh, uh, would play a role if we were to map this, this post rubber boom geography, right? Between the uh, letrado novel and the indigenous counter mapping, uh, there is so much, uh, so many forms of visuality representation, right? And I think even in the case of Candace Slater's book, uh, she deals with orality, right? Primarily, which is which is one, uh, it's it's one of those elements. So I wonder if you have any thoughts on that, right? And I'm thinking also of like satellite images appear in that period right, for the first time. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Oh yeah, satellite images is an amazing one. Yeah, thank you for that question. Yeah, you know, I was telling the, I did a workshop this morning for the graduate students on kind of how to write a book and a dissertation. And one of the things I said is, you know, when we take these projects on, we all have uh, real circumstances in our life that kind of prevent us from maybe doing completely the kind of project that we actually want to do if we were writing in a vacuum and had infinite time. And I think I do lament a little bit that novels are the main focus of my book um, because, uh, you know, there, as you're mentioning, Gustavo, there's so many other ways to get at what the Amazon is. Um, you know, it's easy when you look at the novels to say that primarily what we have about the Amazon are ideas that other people from outside of it have created. But there's so many important poets from the Amazon. I mean, I've thought about poetry a lot. Um, there's indigenous films being made by people in the Amazon. Um, I have another essay that I wrote about indigenous radio production in the Amazon. And, you know, I think radio honestly is where it's at in terms of Amazonian uh, cultural production, because, you know, you can have a radio where there's no electricity. And so this is really the most important information and communication technology for dissemination of, of information in the Amazon. And then actually, it's, it's interesting that you, I've been teaching, um, I taught The Falling Sky last week, last couple of weeks in my class, and we're now reading um, Almia Sudoui's testimonial, which is called Save the Planet. And uh, one thing that we talked about is, you know, when like John Beverly and uh, Doris Summer were writing about testimonial in the 90s, it seemed like it was going to be the next thing. Like, this is how we're going to get access to um, Indigenous voices and um, get outside of this elitist literary canon. And of course, neither one of them could have predicted TikTok, right? <laughs> and so uh, there was actually, I can maybe pull it up here and find it for you all, but there was a recent uh, article in the Washington Post about a young woman from outside of Manaus who is a TikTok star. She's, in, she's indigenous, she lives in the Amazon and she started TikTok and went viral. Um, and so there's all sorts of other ways to, you know, it's, it, we don't have to go through the kinds of authors that I study in the book to try to understand what Amazonia is or the many things that it is. Um, I'm going to try to find this because um, it's really great. Oh, when you put, I forget. I don't know why I haven't learned this, that when you search Google for Amazon, you have to always put minus amazon.com. <laughs> Washington Post. Yeah, here we go. I'll put this in the chat in case you guys want to watch it later. Um, but yeah, so one of the things I've been asking with my uh, asking my students is, you know, what is the relevance of a testimonial like Davi Copenawa's The Falling Sky today? Um, 
when we have so many other ways of hearing directly from people without intermediaries. And I don't think it makes it irrelevant. I think there's something to be said for sitting with a monumental text that is the falling sky, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the question of media, my next project will definitely have more media in it. <laughs> yeah, Ian. Uh, thanks so much, um, Amanda. It was lovely to be with you this morning and again to hear more about your work. Um, my first question dealt with kind of the status of the visual in relationship to the literary. Um, but I think that we've covered that quite a bit. That's been a major point of interest in the discussion. The, my second question is maybe smaller, but I just I had noticed that in your presentation, you regularly cited major figures in the discipline of geography, um, Harvey, Edward Soja, and if you could just elaborate a bit on, on your thinking on cartography in relationship to that discipline. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I was really inspired by spatial theorists to think about this project to try to understand what a literary text could do spatially, um, what it could do geographically. Um, you know, historians of cartography were really helpful for me for understanding uh, what maps do. I think, again, some of these concepts end up being obvious now. Um, you know, this main concept from histori the history of cartography about uh, cartographic illusion um, might have been difficult to explain to people 10 or 20 years ago. But now I think we've all had the experience of following a map on our cell phone and then it not taking us where it's supposed to. And we are not looking around ourselves because we're trusting that map. We believe that the map is the land, um, even though we are all obviously very intellectual here and know that there's obviously more there, but we still, there's something about, we trust that map to actually be the road. Um, I remember going to visit my grandparents once and I ended up on this weird dirt road in the middle of nowhere. And I, um, I was just following Google Maps the whole time. So some of the concepts don't require as much explanation anymore. Um, but I was really inspired by thinking about how, um, that was kind of my, my point of departure, thinking about how literary texts have a similar function that we sometimes believe what they're telling us about the land and especially all of the texts that I study in my book, um, they try very hard to be close to the land. They try to, um, it's fiction, but it's fiction situated in a, in a real geographic context. And so, you know, I think there's a tendency just like with maps to believe what um, the authors are, are saying, and that's, you know, so just concept of real and imagined space when whenever you're in a space, it's, it's, you're always meet, you're always experiencing it sensorially, but also, um, but also through different mediations. And, and oftentimes those mediations or sometimes those mediations can actually block your senses and, and keep you from um, you know, I've drove, I've driven up to the Bay many times since moving to Santa Cruz and I don't know my way around the bay at all without my cell phone. So um, yeah, those were some of the main concepts I think that inspired me. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. I wanna just add a little bit of, of what uh, Gustavo was also uh, um, elaborating here. And is and first of all, thank you very much for an amazing book. I read a couple of the papers before they became the book. and and following your work is amazing. And, and, and it's, it's uh, because you also showed this uh, during, the, during the presentation is material culture, right? How, how important material culture is for, for the peoples of the Amazon. And you showed the Kene. Uh, uh, I think that's, that's a mapping uh, of, of, a, of an, on, on a level that is you know, much more than cartographic, it's cosmological, it has all sorts of uh, relational uh, uh, components uh, is, is, is dress, is protective. I mean, it, it has all sorts of things, right? Um, that, um, that somehow defied the, the power of, of, of the text. That is, we are bounded by the text, uh, even as that work on, on new media or in, on film or in arts, uh, material culture goes way beyond uh, because it's really uh, immersive 
and, and, and located, situated, uh, contextual, and, and emanates from the territory itself. Then uh, we'll love to hear a little bit more about that in your own thoughts. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, actually, Jorge Marcone has a really beautiful essay on um, Las Tres Mitades that was really inspiring for me and in thinking about this. And he's in dialogue with um, Usandowski in this particular essay. And um, the Usandowski book is um, Ecology of the Spoken Word. And um, what Jorge really homes in on in this book is that in what is a text in the Amazon, um, and in the Amazon, a text is something that's co-created with the land, with the ecology. Um, you know, if, if it's oral, it's something that you've created by being in that space, right? Um, and so I think, I, um, I think that there's, yeah, well, it's funny. I'm, I'm also fixing, I'm going to go all over the place here because this is something that I think about a lot. Um, you know, the, the word material culture is is uh, super Western and super um, nature culture divide -y. Um, and, I agree. Yeah, and, and Fernando Santos Granero has a beautiful book called um, The Occult Life of Things. And he talks about, he says in the very, in the intro of the book, he has just this very pithy sentence where I can't remember what it says offhand, but it, the idea is this anthropological, practice of calling something material culture reinforces the nature culture divide and anthropological studies because there isn't a separate cult when when an object is made or created and he's talking about indigenous amazonian cultures it's not considered separate from nature or separate from the person either even it's um it's still a subject. It's a co-created subject, just like Jorge is talking about. It's a subject that has been co-created with the ecology. Um, so I don't know where I'm going with this actually, um, Miguel, thank you for the question. But yeah, I think I, I keep thinking about what terms should we use? Um, you know, a word I use a lot when I teach and when I write is cultural production. And even in that, and after reading Santos Granero, I was like, oh, that's, that's not the right word. But I'm also really inspired by um, Marisol de la Cadena's very simple term, which is um, not only. Uh, I think this is a great theoretical concept that's very simple. And, you know, I think uh, Marisol de la Cadena might say, well, it's cultural production, but not only cultural production, right? It's more than cultural production. It's more than aesthetic. It's more than capitalist. Um, so I think we have to start thinking about questions of material culture as more than material culture. I mean, they aren't not material culture because things do circulate in cultural markets. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that kind of responds to your inquiry, but uh, this is a topic that I, I love to think about. So I, I would love to think about it with you some more as well. Yeah. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So on one side is that, of course, there is that, that I mentioned, but my question was also on, mm. on how a literary critic like you can, de can deal with, mm. with those texts that uh, okay. defy the idea of, of our reading left to right, archival, mm. ink, paper, digital, whatever it is, uh, our yes. ways of archiving knowledge vis-a-vis -vis these productions uh, that are somehow archival themselves, but are embodied because they are functional, but all, 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 all sorts of things, right? Yeah. And if we can okay, well, this, this question is also like, yeah, this is the question. Uh, I think the answer, the simple slash complicated answer is very carefully. Um, I have an essay that's going to come out at some point on a uh, kind of aesthetics in um, this film called Icaros of Vision. And um, that was a really hard essay for me to write. I, I co-wrote it actually with a graduate student um, who specializes in visual culture. And um, it was a really hard essay for me to write because I had to learn so much about Kana um, before I could write it. Um, and then, you know, this gets back to the idea of literary extractivism or cultural extractivism. Um, 
the 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 film that we analyze is um, it takes place in Iquitos at a real ayahuasca lodge, and there's real um, the actor the Shipibo actors are you know Shipibo people from the the lodge, and um, during the peer review process, I think uh, one of the reviewers had said you know it would be great if you could get the perspective of Shipibo peoples on this film as well. And when I reached out, I have a couple um, friends that are Shipibo in Peru. And when I reached out to them, I first just said, hey, how's everything going? And they were like, okay, well, I just got out of the hospital. I had COVID, 85% of my community got COVID. And I was like, okay, how? Uh, what can I do for you? Um, and it just became very clear to me that it, it didn't need to be a priority for me to like get the exact right take on Kana or the film for that particular book. So I think it, I think, um, you know, how can we deal with these texts that aren't traditionally considered texts that maybe we don't have the frameworks for, I think very carefully and very slowly and with great humility um, and yeah, just willingness to be wrong and to be called out for being wrong. Um, I think it is important, an important endeavor to diversify what we think of as a text in order to meaningfully diversify what we study and what we center and what we celebrate. Um, but yeah, we have, you know, we have to take our positionalities into account when we do that. And we have to take into account what we're asking of indigenous subjects, for example, when we, you know, query them for their expertise in order to write an essay that goes into our file that gets us a merit review or something. I mean, it's, it's very complicated. Uh, thank you. I don't know if you have been uh, in, in touch with uh, Pedro Favaron and yeah, Show yeah, we've been in touch. Been working on on Kene as 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 Shipibo Conigo boat. I mean, Sean yeah. of course, uh, a poet, indigenous Shipibo Conigo, a long tradition of healers, and, and Pedro as a, as a visual anthropologist living there for twenty yeah. plus years and now producing. No, yeah. so I think that that will be a really interesting way to to get into conversations. Yeah, thank you for that. My, I actually, um, an undergraduate student of mine was doing a research fellowship last spring and she actually reached out to both of them and was um, she was doing a project on um, indigenous responses to COVID via art. And so there was actually um, a, a coloring book that was put out by uh, an NGO. I can't remember which one, but it was a Shipibo coloring book. Uh, it was Shipibo Kanoa coloring book. And it came alongside photos and Shonam Bencho was in there uh, with Pedro actually. And so she wanted to interview them and she ended up interviewing um, Shonam Bencho and, and getting her take on that. So that was really cool. But yeah, you're absolutely right. Thank you. Marcelo. Thanks so much. It, it was lovely to hear. Uh, from you, as Ian said, like early today and especially right now. Uh, from this so uh, interesting and thought provoking book. Uh, and I was thinking and following a little bit on, on Gustavo's idea on media. And, and I was thinking a lot about this relation in the relation of perspective in relation to that literary tradition of like a creation of an imaginary, which is like to me, and it seems to me, and I may be wrong, but uh, it's like a little much more horizontal in perspective of like the way that the writer have to actually like map in perspective, especially in, uh, in literaturas de floresta that you have like to project in a different direction right uh and right now with recent technologies and the way that actually uh we are like the idea of mapping became like a, a forensic necessity of depict a region that it's under dispute heavily under dispute and becomes like to create another like necessity to create a new kind of media based oriented imaginary based on other perspectives which i imagine thinking about satellites that it's more vertical in a way you know like so like this differences about perspective and like in the way that media thinking about like the literary tradition as like a media that it's related with the book and like in other kinds of more intermedial tradition of like depicting the same like another imaginary that it's much more like 
multimedia that can actually give other dimensions for that same narrative. Uh, if you have any thought about that or like, and how do you think about this question about media and perspective? Wow, I mean, this is, I feel like every one of you has now given me an idea for another project. <laughs> so I don't know if I can respond. It's such an interesting question um, to think about, yeah, the perspective. I guess what I'm thinking of just offhand is, you know, for example, um, Rivera reached the Amazon by boat and then walking, I suppose. And then uh, Vargas Llosa took a plane into, I'm just thinking about the different, the reason I'm thinking about this is because um, Canaima, for example, uh, Gallegos took a plane to Guayana. And so in Canaima, you actually have aerial descriptions of the forest. And they're usually from the perspective of birds or whatever, but you get that. Whereas, you know, La Voragine, you never get that. You're just in the Voragine the whole time. Um, so yeah, I don't have a good answer to your question, but I love, I love this as a project thinking about, um, yeah, I mean, also Gustavo was mentioning, I think was Gustavo, the satellite images, you know, what we get from seeing that aerial perspective. Yeah, I don't know. It's a great question. I think, also, I don't know, I, I, I also think, um, yeah, I don't know what I think. I think I think not only that's what I'll go with. I think, you know, it's good to have this sort of complete view, multi-perspectival view of a place. Um, and sometimes it's nice just to touch a tree and smell it and, you know, be in the place just on a small scale as well. Both and. Thank you. Along those lines, there is that virtual reality installation mm. called Tree, right? Have you oh, familiar with that? No. Particular? So Tree is a is a virtual reality. It, it's funny because it's circulated in film festivals as well as as museums, but it's a virtual reality experience in which you uh, have the sensation of having the perspective of a tree. Oh, cool! Uh, and you grow, yeah, I think if you're gonna, I think you're gonna find it's very interesting to check it out. And you and you grow out, and you grow in the forest, and you and you, you know, you grow arms like they are branches and stuff, and you grow and grow and grow. But then eventually, there's a forest fire, and you can't move because you are a tree. Oh, wow! Uh, and then actually, just to kind of add to this idea of media, because like you know, this is a very immersive uh, proposition, right? It's like yeah. very, like you know, in a sense, it 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 taps into some of the elements that you find um, that you redeem from from La Voragine, right? The sensoriality of El Brujulo in contrast with the the lettered city that that yeah. the narrator brings with him to the forest, right? Uh, but it's interesting to question that sensoriality too, right? How how something like this tree exhibit uh, somehow like. This, this immersive sense of reality may give you the illusion of, mm -hmm. of, of it can be extremely anthropocentric to pretend yeah. to be tree in that particular form. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm throwing this in here because I also, I love that your book is about literature. Uh, so my question about media wasn't about like, because I think it's really easy to be like, oh, literature, let's talk about, you know, whatever, <laughs> indigenous counter mapping. Of course, it's great, very important, fundamental, right? But it's too easy or to go, oh, vision versus sensorial. Like yeah. those, because I think we end up um, resurrecting um, uh, the specter of primitivism in a yeah. new guise. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and I think we also kind of generalize uh, uh, the experience of reading as if that was, as if every form of writing and reading somehow yielded the same subject position yeah. or or orality somehow like it, you know as if it wasn't absolutely easy to be orally fascist and to be literarily yes. uh you know uh, whatever right so yeah. i think it's really important to resist those binaries and also to resist the urge to dismiss novels because everyone every time you mention a novel it seems like an army i'm not and i'm not writing about novels but i'm like i'm defending it like Thank you. <laughs> An army of people seem to rise up and be like, why are we talking about novels? You know, and, and I think it's really easy. I think, and I and I hardly ever am convinced for it. So I'm just bringing this up, not as a question, right? But like uh, uh, 
throw more things on this one's map, I think Ian might have a more coherent thing to say than I do. So, Well, let me respond to that quickly um, with a few thoughts. One is, um, yeah, thank you for that, because I think I, uh, honestly, I, I sometimes despair about being a literary scholar. This is the confessional part of the talk. Um, sometimes I despair about being a literary scholar in the 21st century. Um, you know, who reads anymore and um, things like that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I, this this dissertation project started in part because I was doing a different project that was sort of handed to me by my advisor that I never could get into. And it was reading these 18th century archaeology texts. And I was just like, ah, I just want to read a novel, you know. And so I, I, I went to novels as kind of an escape from this other tedious um, research that I had been doing. So I really appreciate that. In terms of tree... Uh, I hadn't heard about that. I really hope that whoever made that read Vivero Castro before they <laughs> made the exhibit. Um, and in terms of VR, I just want to do a plug for a friend, a uh, colleague amiga, um, Martina Broner, who is assistant professor at Dartmouth. She's doing really, really cool work on media. Um, I like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so, she just had an amazing article come out on... Um, Cinema was, Journal? Yeah, yeah. What is the the film? I'm blanking. Uh, it's the cinema cinema journal. I'd change. Yeah, the but what's it's, it's uh, you know this famous film. Um, El brazo de la serpiente. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. El brazo de la, de la serpiente. So she has an amazing film that's thinking about the media in this kind of co-constructive way as making the film, and she's doing work on VR as well. So everybody, write down Martina Broner and check her out. Um, and then did, I wanted to say maybe one more thing, but I can't remember, so I'll, I'll go to Ian. No, my comment was actually just to kind of second what Gustavo was saying. I feel like in the present moment, there is this kind of negation of literature, right? And this um, drive to both in academia and outside, right? To, to visibilize, right? If something is visible, that's a positive thing. And I mean, especially in kind of these very urgent um, questions surrounding indigenous rights, climate change, et cetera. But on the flip side of that, right, I think that what you're doing in your book and what others have commented, right, is this there's this kind of 19th century moment that's also very yeah. fixated on, on visibilizing these spaces for the purposes of extraction, right? And obviously yeah. those forces and logics haven't gone away. So I, it would just be interesting to hear um, your thoughts, right, on this kind of drive to to make visible. I know that there's really interesting work in, in Black studies along those lines, but that's yeah. already getting into another field. Yeah, that's a really, I mean, that gets back to the question of mapping, right? Like, what, what do you put on a map and what are the consequences of, of mapping something? Um, you know, in the case of these indigenous counter maps, it's mapping things in order to contest state and corporate claims. But sometimes mapping something makes its presence known in a way that ends up being harmful. Um, I'll kind of give two very non-academic uh, thoughts in response to this. One is uh, I sometimes teach a course here that's called something like mapping fictions or something. And one of the activities that I have my students do after we read about mapping, um, you know, uh, history of cartography and things like that is I ask them to draw a counter map of our campus. And so first we think about, we look at the campus maps and we think about what things have been erased from the campus maps. And they're really quick. The, the UCSC students are awesome and they're also very woke. So um, they're very quick to point out that there's no map showing gender neutral bathrooms on campus, for example. There's no map indicating uh, handicap accessibility to our buildings, et cetera. And there's no map of like alternative forest routes in, on campus. And also our campus, um, I happen to think we have the most beautiful campus in the world. Um, but we have uh, lots of, I'm looking right now outside my window at a redwood forest. And uh, the whole campus is surrounded by redwood forests. And um, over the years, for decades, I assume, you know, uh, college students have constructed weird things in the forest that you come upon, like there's this amazing place called the Buddha hut where there's like this structure made out of sticks and people come and leave offerings and probably do other things. Um, but it was, a, we had a really interesting discussion when they were making the counter maps um, because some people wanted to highlight some of those things on the map. And then they started to think like, well, what are the consequences of um, doing that? Right. What are the consequences of making a map showing these secret places or, a very classic UCSC example is one of my students said, can I make a map of all the places on campus where you can smoke weed without getting caught? And I was like, well, yeah, you can, but then you're mapping them, right? Uh, what, what does it mean to map those places? They're no longer secret. You can suddenly get caught. 
Um, so I think the question of, you know, what do you visibilize? Um, there's, you know, this concept, um, I'm, I'm blanking on the name of the, the anthropologist, but it's um, ethnographic refusal, right? Um, and well, even in Latin American literary studies, this is a thing like Dory Summer talks about uh, Rigoberta secrets and what's being withheld. And I think that's, that is part of it. And that gets back to Miguel's question about um, how do you engage with these texts that are other that don't belong to you and do that responsibly. Um, and then the other sort of non-academic example is um, really lovely book that I like, um, Jenny O'Dell's, um, I'm blanking on the title. What is it called? Something about um, how to do nothing. What a great, yeah, Jenny O'Dell's How to Do Nothing. Um, at the very beginning, she's a Bay Area writer. And at the very beginning of the book, she talks about this redwood in Oakland that is, I think, the only old growth redwood in all of Oakland. And it's because it's really hard to get to. It's on the side of a hill. Um, it, she talks about how it has made itself useless by being inaccessible. And she talks about being useless as a great way to resist the attention economy um, and the instrumentalization that happens to all of us in late capitalism, right? And I, th I think about that too, like this tree, um, yeah, I, I kind of want to go see it now after reading the book, right? But I think maybe I shouldn't, maybe I'm not supposed to go see that tree. It's supposed to sit there and be useless and just survive. And if we all start to go see it after reading the book, it's it's going to start to maybe have root damage and who knows what else. So, yeah, I don't have a, a very theoretical response to your question, but yeah, I think it's an important thing to think about what are, you know, it's it's a tension between diversifying the canon or diversifying the field and also thinking about the consequences of, of doing so. In my book, actually, I do talk about um, that is something that happened with ayahuasca. Um, anthropologists started studying ayahuasca and suddenly there's ayahuasca tourism and um, Marlene Dopkin de Rios is one of the anthropologists who was very early on writing about um, ayahuasca, uh, ayahuasca shamanism and she issues a mea culpa years later and says I realize now that these books that I wrote in order to visibilize center indigenous knowledges ended up having this other effect um, which I think is also kind of what happens in each one of my chapters actually the authors are trying to shed light on something that's not being looked at. And in doing that, they inadvertently show or hide something else. I just want to add one thing. I, uh, a good book always makes you think of a number of other things you want to write or people should write, right? And I think that uh, your book on mapping and counter mapping made me think that we need a book on the Amazon about being lost. Mm. Uh, because that's obviously a very important topic, you know, it's a cliche topic in a certain kind of writing and it's usually like, you know, the, the, the metropolitan subject lost in the jungle and, and mm. it's, you know, what I mean, right. Yeah. Uh, but even that cliche, that cliche event is very interesting. Yeah. Right? What is, what, what, what is at stake in being lost? What, what, what is productive about being lost? Uh, uh, we are so obsessed with knowing and seeing. Yes. Right. And it's not like that's uh, only a, you know, being lost is, is wide, you know, like, where does the sound come from? I can't mm. locate it, right? Yeah. Or like indigenous stories in which, oh, you hunted too much, now you're lost. We just saw, we had a film, uh, a fabri the other day in the Amazon mm. lab. And this character, it is a story, uh, uh, um, a Desana story, right? This character goes hunting while he had already a lot of meat, you know, and goes hunting more because of his new gun. And then he gets trapped into this world of this, the monkeys and he can't yeah. get all. So he's lost, right? It's a lot. Of, so it, 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 I felt to me like a, a, a reverse shot yeah. uh, to your book would be, <laughs> would be about being lost. Um, yeah, actually, uh, my, my dear colleague, Kirsten, who's here, uh, I, I gave a very early version of a book talk here at UC Santa Cruz years ago now. And uh, I think that was something that she said to me in the comments. She said, I don't think this, this project is actually about mapping. I think it's about being situated in place and getting lost. And I was like, Oh shoot! I think you might be right, but I just don't have time to rewrite it. <laughs> but yeah, I would love to do a book about getting lost. I'm also very, again, uh, interested in getting lost just as a person. Um, I, yeah, I, I, and also as an academic, I think, um, yeah, two. I'll say the person one first, which is, you know, again, I live somewhere amazing. I love taking hikes around this area, and. Um, 
I had downloaded all trails and I use all trails to find great hikes. And then I, sometimes I'm doing that thing that I criticize in my book where I'm wandering through the forest and looking at my GPS to make sure I'm on the right trail. And I was just saying to a friend of mine, who's a, a very constant hiking companion, I was like, can we just go to the forest and not, and like leave our cell phones in the car and just figure it out. Um, so, so that on the one hand, and then academically, you know, here's my meta reflection on writing the book. Um, you know, this was my dissertation. It became my book and you're, you're on this tenure track. So you have to kind of rush and, and do your thing. Um, and so everything, even like my time was very regimented and, and um, instrumentalized in, in the lead up to writing this book. And um, I was actually talking to a non-academic friend the other day. because I was like, gosh, I just, I'm, I feel a little lost about my second book and I'm not really sure which direction to go in. And I have all these ideas, but I can't decide on which one. And my friend who's not an academic was like, Amanda, some people never write one book their whole life. And you're freaking out about not having your second book project defined like a few months after your first project came out. And I was like, oh, this is why we have non-academic friends. <laughs> and I think like part of what I want to do after this first book is also get lost a little bit, like not, not read to write the next essay or not read to figure out the next project, but just read where my attention is called and see what comes out of that kind of getting lost in the archive or getting lost in the stacks. Um, yeah, I think, I think, uh, I don't know. I think that can be a really immersive to use a word that's come up a few times and, and um, fulfilling experience. Any final questions, comments? Just to comment on that topic, because like I imagine like a situationist derive, derive in like in the Amazon could take like a decade to get out, you know, like, so just like a comment on that note. So I, well, anyway. And it seems like no, if you don't, finish don't writing, get... you failed, you know, it seems like if you finish writing it, you found yourself and that's probably not working out. <laughs> I think, I think it's a don't get too lost is the caveat here. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, I just want to say thank you all so much. I mean, it really is such a pleasure to, you know, share this work with other, those of you who have said that you've read it. I mean, it, it really is, um, it means a lot to me that you took the time to read the work. Uh, Jennifer even mentioned reading it more than once. And I am so grateful for that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for all of your really generative questions. Uh, I've been taking notes this whole time and I'm probably gonna steal your ideas for something after I get lost for a little bit, but um, thank you so much for being here and Gustavo again for having me, Jennifer for your lovely words. It's been a pleasure. This has really, really been great. Thank you both. I hope that we can have uh, more events in which you just come to be with us or participate you know with your words again uh we'll, we'll add you to to the list to make sure you stay stay with the amazon lab for the next year year and a half in which we're gonna be yeah uh, doing events yeah i would love to and i'd love to um, report back on the digitization project with you all as well in fact we're, we're planning on a um an, an, an event that focuses on museums archives and memory oh. Cool. The Amazon. So I think I think it'd be great uh, if you you know at least shared with us at that point uh, how that project's going to be. I'll I'll keep you in the loop. We'll talk more about about that. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks so Thanks. much.